1699, Nikolai gathered together all his advisors, peers, treasurers, and tax collectors into the Grand Hall of the Palace at Bucharest, declaring the meeting of the Third National Council. There, they remained for three weeks, servants bringing food in and garbage out, arguments and fights heard every night. On the 20th of March, 1699, Kral Nikolai emerged onto the balcony and explained the developments of the Third National Council to the expectant crowd below. What was discussed therein was a total overhaul of the tax system, moving the responsibility from the Romanian Orthodox Church to institutions set up and administered by the state. New developments in infrastructure and relevant technologies had made it possible to implement such a plan. It would begin with a major roadworks project, felling many acres of forest and improving nearly every road in Romania as they built new ones alongside them, going to places once remote and rural. This network of roads would then open up the second stage, where a military contingent of about 35,000 men would be used to transport supplies along these roads and build the government tax houses in every town of more than 1,000 people. In all towns smaller than that, the old church-based system would remain. He promised the people that this reform would, after one final bout of unthinkable spending, raise Romania up out of its catatonic state, and no longer would it balance on the razor's edge of bankruptcy every time they had to spend. The plan began immediately, and the people believed in Kral Nikolai's new vision for Romania. 8,000 ducats were spent to get this great project moving, leaving only 590 for the crown to administer the state with. By the 1st of January 1700, the world order had changed in ways most unexpected. Namely, the three most powerful and dominant empires the world had ever seen, which dominated the world a century ago, are now on the brink of total annihilation. Germany, once undisputed as the great power in Europe, vanguard of the Protestant Reformation, and loyal Romanian ally, was by 1700 clinging to life along the Baltic Sea, in their singular city of Stettin. Bavaria, Brunswick, Pomerania, Utrecht, Bohemia, Nassau, and Silesia had cannibalized Germany, all kingdoms which broke away from the Great Reich and tore it to pieces like a pack of dogs and a noble stag. Any one of them would not have been successful, but all of them at once was far too much for Germany, and now the tired old Kaiser Arnulf Amadeus III sits in his cold throne, looking out at the sea as he and his people wait for their inevitable subjugation. The Golden Horde, once master of Asia and Catholic despot above the wild hordes that were once their brothers, now finds itself trod underfoot by their horsemen. The Mongol hegemon of the East ensured peace along the Silk Road, brought civilization to Middle Asia, and was the very reason for Romania's existence due to their intervention. Now, Khan Kuchuk Mohammed Purisirvan, whose blood ran thick with the legacy of great Mongol, Arab, and Finnish Khans that had ruled as imperious Catholic masters in the East for centuries, now sat in his yurt, surrounded by his freezing court in Komi, the last refuge of him and his people. That Siberian nightmare was where they attacked traders and passers-by, traveling along the trade route they once protected, living off of what they were able to steal in such a manner. The Muslim hordes of the Nogai, Kazakh, and Transoxiana had run roughshod over the vast holdings and fertile lands of the Golden Horde, and had only let them survive in their icy refuge because they no longer cared to finish them off. A shameful state that indeed came from seemingly nowhere. Their lonely fires burn in the wild north, much like the camps of their ancestors had. Fallen from greatness, they had been returned to where they began, the dirt. Then, perhaps greatest of the three empires was Armenicon. Vast and sprawling, their domain reached from the Indian Ocean to the Caspian Sea, from Tunis to the Himalayas. They were the greatest and most unchallenged empire, and so it seemed that these Messalian people would rule eternal in their land. They had overcome the Ghaznavids and the Seljuks, pushing not only their great empires, but Islam itself to the very brink of extinction. They spread their once obscure, heretical cult to its fullest extent, and overcoming their heretical status to become another house of Christianity. Now they found themselves packed into a crowded, filthy city straddling the Nile, waiting to make their final stand against any of their neighbors which could grind them into dust at any time. 
Truly, their fall had been the most momentous, consumed from the inside out by their desperate Muslim minority, who had managed to convert horsemen from the east in the form of the Nogai, Avaria, and Transoxiana, and betrayed by their former vassal state Anatolikon, which seceded and invaded when it saw an opportunity to lord over their old masters. Now, Epiphanios Chrysophios IV lost the ability to sleep through the night, and leaps from his broken bed into his tattered armor to fight the enemy, which had not yet come. Still, as his attendees put him back to rest, they all knew that one day he would be right, and it would be the end of their long, stubborn, and glorious history. The practical absence of these three great empires has made developments by the year 1700 more scattered and crackling with the kinetic energy of constant change. Europe was mostly fragmented, Burgogne had failed to unite the French region, and was now on an even field with France, Valois, and Poitou. Scandinavia kept changing hands between Norlanti, Norway, and Gotland, and Eastern Europe was as fractured as it was before the Mongol invasion centuries ago. The Papal State had stepped up as the major European power, and even with so much of Europe under Protestant sway, they commanded respect as the major colonial power of that hemisphere. Africa was largely calm, with Bambuk and Kilwa dominating their livable regions, Elodia keeping the torch of Massalian Christianity alive in the continent, and South Africa under the control of the Papal State. Asia was also fairly distributed in terms of power, with China fractured still, Japan steadily increasing in size, and the Bahamanas of India fighting over lordship of the subcontinent. Bengal was a major colonial power, with holdings in California, Alaska, and Australia. Malacca also controlled the spice routes of the South Pacific, and held much of western Mexico. The New World was just beginning to be carved up by colonial powers, with the Anglo-Ask in Canada, Burgone in Brazil, the Papal State in Peru, Colombia in southern Mexico, and even Catholic Andalusia in parts of La Plata. Overall, colonization was slow, with the world as fractured as it was, it was not difficult to understand why. Nations had to get their own houses in order first and foremost. On the 14th of January, scholars of the province of Huangzhou in the Chinese kingdom of Wu endeavored to consolidate all of the world's knowledge. It is this endeavor that is commonly accepted to mark the beginning of the Enlightenment era. In 1703, Armenikite colonists settled in uninhabited Siberian land, Pelim and Solikamsk, which bordered Perm. They opened up relations with the Golden Horde, which bordered them to the north, finding a kindred spirit as a fellow fallen empire. They established their new paltry territory as Hassa broke down the makeshift city walls to Litkopolis and overwhelmed the Armenikites, raising what was very nearly their last city to the ground. Emperor Epiphanios IV stayed to fight, and fight he did, though he was speared through by a man on horseback before the completion of the siege. In 1706, Bavaria made Germany a vassal state, becoming its overlord. In 1708, the Romanian tax system overhaul was completed, and it was put to the test on the 22nd of February when King Sinegils Hasting VII declared the Anglo-Lisk Romanian Nationalist War, with the goal of conquering Trenchin. Kral Nikolai ordered all the forts to be manned, and all the soldiers to invade Wallachia into niche from Vidin, so as to cleave the country in half. The 39,000 Anglo-Lisk soldiers invading from the north were to be left to their devices, as it was presumed that they would be unable to break the fortress line, especially now that it was well-funded and therefore well-supplied. General Mercea Cantemir was placed at the helm of 35,000 men. The Anglo-Lisk force acted strangely, however, and decided to attack the Romanian army directly instead. The Romanian force was defeated at the Battle of Hant, and as they fled south, the Anglo-Lisk took Trenchin. Having fled to Silistria, an Anglo-Lisk force of 30,000 men that had entered the Black Sea launched an amphibious invasion from the east, engaging the weakened soldiers in battle. Romania lost the Battle of Silistria as well, and that contingent fled north. Surrounding provinces were commanded to increase their production of guns and cannons, as well as sent every one of their eldest sons off to war to defend the homeland. By 1709, a renewed force of 46,000 men under General Cantemir attacked the 27,000 men attempting to siege Silistria. The Anglo-Lisk were decimated and Cantemir's army marched further south, targeting a force of 24,000 that had just landed from the Aegean Sea. The Anglo-Lisk lost this fight as well. 
Finally, Cantemir set his sights north, to reclaim Trenchin and defeat the 40,000 men guarding it. They met at the Battle of Bekesh, where 30,000 reinforcements came from Wallachia and won the day for the enemy. The army would recover in Buzau while the Anglos ran rampant, steadily defeating fort after fort. It was around this time that soldiers from their colonial holdings began to land in Romania as well. By November of 1710, the battered Cantemir marched back north with 55,000 men to challenge the Anglo-esque at Bekesh, and hopefully turn the tide of war. The Battle of Sabolks began on the 2nd of January, 1711, and ended in a decisive Romanian victory on the 18th of January. Trenchin was reclaimed on the 11th of October, and then Cantemir set about occupying as much land as he could, knowing that he could do it faster than the Anglosk were able to with all the forts making every win a bloody struggle. However, on the 12th of June, 1712, 66,000 Anglosk soldiers dislodged them from their position, killing 30,000 and renewing their siege on Trenchin. King Sinegils Hastings VII sent Crown Nikolai a peace treaty in August of 1713, demanding Trenchin, Hant, and the ceding of Targoviste to Wallachia. Crown Nikolai refused, and sent 62,000 more men into Wallachia, with the goal of scorching the earth behind them, forcing Wallachia to abandon their advances into Romania. 36,000 Wallachian citizens were massacred at Sofia, and 11,000 more at Castoria. General Cantemir was now noted for his brutality, a reputation that would follow him for the rest of his life. 49,000 Inglis landed in 1714 and expelled him from his position yet again, fleeing to Suisava. King Sinegils VII sent another peace treaty with the same terms, and Crown Nikolai rejected that one too, using the funds from his newfound tax system to purchase thousands of mercenaries. England sent three more peace treaties to Romania in 1715 alone, all of which Nikolai turned down. He decided to split the military into four 30,000-man armies, which would attack in a unified line along a single stretch of territory, which worked well because they supported each other's attacks. Bucharest fell to Wallachia in 1716, but Kral Nikolai did not allow this to phase him. In 1718, at the Twin Battles of Spiech, 80,000 Romanians defeated a surprise attack from around 60,000 Anglosk and 40,000 Wallachians. This is where the turning point of the war is accepted to have occurred. Even though Kral Nikolai was essentially bankrupting himself at this point, he was refusing to lose the war. On the 1st of March, 1720, King Sinegils Hastings VII offered a white peace to Romania. Kral Nikolai, after 13 years of war, rejected their white peace and went to occupy all of Inglisk Austria proper. By 1721, both armies were engaged in a costly game of cat and mouse, with the Inglisk occupying territory and running from direct military encounters, and Romania doing precisely the same thing. King Sinegils VII was sending offers of a white peace every month, but Kral Nikolai simply started killing their messengers. On the 11th of August, the minor French state of Urgell joined the war on the side of the Anglisk, which was a surprise for both sides. The Urgellians helped them to cleave Romania in half and occupy the forts along that line, disallowing Kral Nikolai access to the northern half of his country. The rest of 1721 would be spent breaking through this new barrier. Meanwhile, on the 17th of December, 1721, a Bavarian messenger entered through the palace doors of Kaiser Arnulf III without bothering to knock. The Kaiser remained staring out at the Baltic as the messenger demanded his attention. As he remained silent and stoic, they took his crown off of his head and draped the castle with the flag of the Kingdom of Bavaria. He asks them if he can visit his cellar one last time before they coronate his replacement prince, and they agreed to let him. As the guards escort him down to the dark, dank cellar doors, he closes the door behind him. An old man, he poses no threat. In front of the Stettin Palace, they run up the blue and white as the old Imperial Eagle is lowered. The messenger watches from the balcony with great satisfaction as the old flag flutters off into the Baltic Sea. Just then, a great explosion is heard from within the castle, seemingly from its very core. As though a great, secret munition stockpile had been suddenly lit aflame. As the building caves in on itself, killing everyone inside, the guards who ran up the new flag leap into the sea, and are the only survivors on the property that day. The smoldering rubble was the final testament of 623 years of glory, the end of the First Reich.
Meanwhile, in 1722, the battles of Lassi and Halix defeated the surviving armies of the Inglilisk and repelled the Wallachians back behind their own border. Much of 1722 would be spent reoccupying territory still controlled by the invaders. Bucharest was retaken in December, and from this point on, Romania was finally winning the war. The people, suffering greatly under the sheer costs of this war that was essentially one of Kral Nikolai's ego, was making them rather discontent. Papers started to circulate throughout the non-occupied provinces of an anti-monarchical, constitutionalist, and even republican nature. Kral Nikolai took money out of his own pocket to ban these subversive papers, under pain of execution for treason. On the 30th of July, 1723, Kral Nikolai sent a peace treaty to King Senegil's Hasting the Seventh of England. He demanded Sophia and Solnach from Wallachia, and also demanded Lignitz in Anglilisk Austria proper be ceded to the German Kingdom of Silesia. England also would be mandated to pay 10% of their income to Romania in the form of war reparations for 10 years, and finally, England was to renounce its rivalry with Romania, promising a state of peace between the two for the foreseeable future. King Sinegils Hastings VII accepted the treaty, and the 15 years war finally came to an end, with over 1.9 million deaths altogether, 705,000 of them Anglilisk, leaving many of their colonies dangerously depopulated and strained as a result. Kral Nikolai hailed himself as a hero, but the people were still discontent. He could have ended the war almost a decade earlier with a simple white peace, but he kept going and sent hundreds of thousands to the fight, making this rather minor conflict one of the deadliest in European history. Still, the Anglilisk were repelled and thoroughly humiliated via the strategic feats of Kral Nikolai and his generals, and Romania had shown that despite being a secondary power, it was not to be trifled with. In March of 1724, Brazil broke free from the Andalusian yoke, becoming the first independent colony in the world. It also became a republic, the third of its kind after Buryatia and, most significantly, Wu adopted the ambitious new Enlightenment philosophy of governance. Meanwhile, by the 19th of December 1724, the results of the war were taking their toll on England, to the point that the nobility overthrew the Hastings dynasty, putting King Serdic Kebang on the throne. They also had to release Wallachia from the personal union because they couldn't afford to rebuild it. Wallachia hastily affirmed the patriarch of an old noble family as the first monarch in generations, crowning him Kral Sergiu Roman. His first action on the throne was to declare Romania as their main rival. So, while Romania had achieved a lasting peace from the bothersome Inglilisk, they had not escaped the cycle of enmity along their longest border, the border with Wallachia. On the 23rd of November, 1728, Prince Ioan Tepelus was killed in a hunting accident, and the people's faith in the monarchy continued to falter. A new child was born to Kral Nikolai Tepelus within the year, who he named Vladut. Despite this, 14 revolutionary regiments rose up in Maramures, sensing the opportunity. Led by Petrascu Campanienu, they raked havoc as Kral Nikolai sent 30,000 men to crush their insurrection, spending yet more money on an endeavor of war. Mircea Cantemir was put at the helm of that army and instructed to take no prisoners. Indeed, not a single revolutionary was left alive, and by 1730, the province was back under the control of the crown. Meanwhile, as one revolution was put down, another one was only just beginning. Anatolia Khan found itself at odds with 20,000 rebels of much the same kind. On the 4th of November, 1730, Anatolia Khan fell to the revolutionaries, who enforced their demands. They stormed the major prison in their capital of Kanya, beheaded the king, and instituted a revolutionary republic under Consul Bartholomeos Arsenios, complete with a new flag and all a quarter green stripe at mast representing prosperity, and three quarters solid black, representing the resolute struggle for liberty. A simple, powerful standard flew above revolutionary Anatolikon, now calling itself the birthplace of the revolution. This sent shockwaves across Europe, and angered every crowned head thereof. Kral Nikolai, enraged by these developments and paranoid for the safety of his crowned head, began to spend over half of the new tax money meant to help rebuild Romania on enforcing counter-revolutionary measures instead. On the 28th of March, 1734, Armenia Khan was finally overcome. 
the Kingdom of Perm had invaded, and despite brutal fighting, including the valiant efforts of the last emperor, Epiphanios Chrysophios V, who burnt the Permian king alive in battle, Armenia Khan was no more. After 795 years of defying the odds, Armenia Khan had been finally subdued by fate. Meanwhile, after a long, violent, and undoubtedly accomplished life, Kral Nikolai died of a heart attack induced by stress in July, while Vladut was still just a child, leaving Romania in a Queen Regency under Queen Adelina.